Hey, good morning from Kansas City, and welcome to Sports Beat Live. This is our weekly chat session where we talk Royals with the folks at the Star who cover the team and with you. Please send us your questions and comments and join in the conversation. A shout out to our sponsor, the University of Kansas Health System. You'll hear from them a little later in the show. Let's say good morning to beat writer Lynn Worthy and columnist Sam Mellinger and Vahe Gregorian. Hello, guys. Good morning. Hey, let's uh, let's try not to bunt into a triple play today. Um, okay, a little bit of a cheap shot there. Um, but we also um, get started with not the best of news. That's Jackson Coar's Major League debut on Monday night. I've got the numbers here. Let me read them to you. Um, he got the start. He lasted two-thirds of an inning, threw 39 pitches, 21 for strikes, Oof. faced seven batters, surrendered three hits, four runs, all earned, threw three wild pitches before um, Mike Matheny mercifully got him out of the game for Urban Santana. Lynn, just take us through um, the decision to, you know, to, to give Coar the start, and then we'll talk about maybe where it goes from here. Yeah, he'd been, you know, their best pitcher in the minors, at least statistically. Um, you know, he he's right there with the guys, you know, that group with Singer, Bubich, Daniel Lynch. Um, they'd all been, you know, spring training, big league camp two years in a row. They were a part of the alternate site. They're, you know, top prospects, I think, uh, coming into this year. Coar was a top 100 prospect by Baseball America, um, one of the top four prospects in their uh, farm system by both Baseball America and MLB.com. And he just, you know, in six starts at AAA, he'd been lights out. So um, things looked like they were lined up for him. You know, I mean, I saw, of course, you know, not that it's uh, an indicator of what the organization should do, but I mean, you started to see in the last couple of weeks, social media, Royals fans talking about, well, they're not trying to win if they don't bring up Jackson Coar. Well, they brought up Jackson Coar. And they didn't win um, last night, <laughs> losing eight to three to the to the Angels. You're right. He was the uh, he won the monthly award for uh, the, the, the AAA uh, in AAA Pitcher of the Year for uh, for the East. I guess it was there was there was great anticipation. I know that. You know, when the, some of the talk that you, you were hearing was that Coar might have the biggest or the best upside of any of the early 2018 pitchers taken in that in that draft. And we just didn't see it last night. Certainly, uh, as you said, Lynn, the numbers in Omaha were terrific. I suspect that uh, that we'll see better performances from Jackson Coar, but just a shame really Vahe, isn't it, that uh, that it started this way for him? It, it is because, you know, it's such a thrill, right, when this is happening, especially with the guy as touted as he is. And the Royals do a nice job making a big fuss about it. Um, you know, he'll get his jersey from that game and uh, it'll be it'll be in a frame, but it, it, it won't look the same as it would if he'd had a really nice debut, I think. Um, I'm struck by one thing, and I, you guys are all equipped to expand on it better than I am, but – there is this place in between what more can he do in triple a and he's ready. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing, right? It, it's it. And I, I make no judgment yet on whether he's going to be good in his next start. Who knows? He it might be to quote Sam Mellinger, just that he was nervy um, last night. I, it's hard to know, but it's just um, a great reminder that this stuff is not an automatic transition from one level to the next, especially as we think about other people we're excited about. Um, it's just, it's, there's a, pro there is a process. I hate to use the term, but there is. And maybe part of his process is, okay, that's what you learn from this game. See you next time. And, and uh, he's a little more what we thought he might be next time out. Yeah, Sam, we'll, let's dig a little deeper into the Sam Mellinger dictionary here. Um, <laughs> You know, it's a thin book. <laughs> mine, mine's a pamphlet, so uh, maybe just a folder. Um, so, 
what would you think, Sam? I, I, I don't know if I, what I was expecting last night, I was hoping for his sake that, you know, he'd have a little bit, you know, he'd have more success and go a little deeper in the game. I, We've seen Royals, you know, pitchers make their major league debuts and, and have, you know, and, and pitch better than Jackson Kowar did last night. What was the one or two things that struck you about the debut that you just went, well, I didn't, I didn't expect that. I was really surprised. I thought he was going to be really good last night. Um, really, like, I didn't, you know, not, I'm not talking about a shutout or anything like that, but I, th- I thought he was going to be good um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, we, we talked about how he's performing. Um, I also think that it matters that he has a changeup like a, a really good change up. I, I just think that that's a good weapon when you get behind in the count, you you can even it up because guys are amped up for the fastball. And um, yeah, I just, he, he was, he was really well positioned. Um, I, I did think that he was super nervous. Um, you know, the cameras, you know, when he's on the mound, I mean, his, his chest is going in and I mean, it, I, and, and I thought you saw that in, in, um, in his pitches as well. Um, the, the three wild pitches that you mentioned, and um, I guess off the top of my head, I can't remember which which pitches, um, you know, went to the backstop. But there was a curveball that went about fifty four feet, and you know, you can't tell me he's not overthrowing that, you know. And, and there's fastballs that 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 are left up, um, and then and then also a remarkable number of his strikes were just right down the middle. <laughs> Is he like when he was hitting the zone? It was it was right there where the bats are going to be. Uh, it was it was terrible. He he was awful. Um, but I, I just I don't think that that means much going forward, or at least it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, somebody this morning that I was talking to reminded me that um, Corey Kluber. It wasn't it wasn't his first start, but it was his first start of the season um, of his first full season was against the Royals, and the Royals scored six off him in, in the first inning. Um, Tom Glavin, um, I saw a list of, of, you know, some notable pitchers who had disastrous um, uh, first starts and Tom Glavin was number one on that list. And I looked up that game and it was, <laughs> it, it, it was an S show. So it, it doesn't, you know, I, I just think that this guy's 24 years old. I think, you know, they're not bringing up a kid. Um, he pitched in the college world series. He's, he's pitched in big moments before. So it's it just, I was just really shocked. I thought that if anybody, this guy would be calm and ready for the moment, and he just wasn't. Um, so that's on him. Um, you know, I think it's understandable. No, nobody's should think he's not a good pitcher now, uh, but that's on him, and and he needs to have the confidence in himself to perform at that level. Which I mean, these are the best hitters in the world. You know what I mean? Like th- this is no small thing. Uh, but he's got it in him. He's got everything in him to be a good starting pitcher uh, going forward. And I, and I expect him in his next start, which he'll get. I expect him to be good. It's kind of tough to, you know, you're, you're, uh, you last only two thirds of an inning and then you go to the dugout and you have to sit there for, you know, the rest of the game with the camera panning on you every time that, uh, that you come up in the conversation. And so there's Jackson Kowar sitting lonely in the dugout. Um, and but I actually saw him, you know, with Brady Singer too, trying to, I, I guess, breaking down the game. Let's, uh, let's hear from Jackson Kowar. Here's what he had to say after his performance on Monday night against the Angels. For the Royals, 24-year-old Jackson Kowar will make his first start in the big leagues tonight against a potent Angels lineup that is averaging five and a half runs per game at home this year. Kowar has had a terrific start at AAA and was recently named the AAA East Pitcher of the Month of May. Tani with the lead at second base. Anthony Rendon will be the next hitter. What happens on the payoff? It's on its way. It's grounded through the left side. That's going to be a base hit. Shohei Otani is going to be waved home. He better hurry. Here comes the throw. He'll score. And an RBI hit by Anthony Rendon gives the Angels a 1-0 lead. Great at-bat by Anthony Rendon. Coart comes back with a 97-mile-an-hour fastball, but this one catches the heart of the plate. Rendon, again, hits it hard. For now, the Angels have runners at second and third, where a hit could mean two more runs. Into center field, hangs up, but not long enough to be caught. It's an RBI. The Angels add another, and they lead it. Mad Max keeps just... Hitting and hitting and hitting since getting healthy. Two to nothing. And moving up to second base is Stassi in the third wild pitch of the inning. High bouncing ball. That will play it. Another run for the Angels. An RBI for Iglesias. That'll bring up the seventh hitter here in the inning. Juan Lagares. Lagares into right field. Down for a base hit. 
The Angels lead it four to nothing. Oh, a two out RBI feels good. And another base hit with a runner in scoring position. So Jackson Coars big league debut goes 39 pitches and he gives up four runs in the bottom of the first inning. Hey, we didn't hear from Coar then, but we saw it. And uh, uh, I think that was just as um, just as ugly. And uh, when did, did Jackson Coar say anything after the game? What did, what did he say about just how he felt about it and his, uh, you know, his, his nerves? Uh, what, what did Jackson say? He actually said that he thought nerves was really only the first couple of batters. And then after that, it was just not being able to execute pitches. But, I mean, watching it, um, you know, like Sam mentioned, you could see him breathing like the, the, the chest and shoulders up and down. And it was, you know, and I remember Daniel Lynch's um, debut. There was a shot of him when he got back to the dugout after his first inning, sort of giving a big exhale like, whew. And I remember thinking, and, um, you know, Mike Matheny said this, and of course he's going to, you know, be optimistic. But I remember actually while the game was going on thinking that maybe if he could get through the first inning that he might settle in and, you know, look more like what we might expect that he would look like, but he just never got there. Um, and, you know, and, and even you look at like even the, the, that clip we just showed, it wasn't like they were hitting balls off of the wall and, you know, they didn't hit out of the park and it was all – uh, I believe it was all singles and then walks is what, you know, did the damage. And then obviously yanking those wild pitches. Um, he just, you know, he, he, he said it was really the execution, but um, I think he mentioned the Otani at bat as one, you know, and that was a walk where he just, he, he, he could still feel himself sort of like, you know, heart racing and all that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like that had more. It had more the 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 atmosphere, the moment, the making your big league debut had more to do with the results than just the first couple of batters. But that's you know that's what he said afterwards. Yeah. Um, look, it was uh, where I go with this now is the the 2018 draft class because now correct me if I'm wrong, but three of them are now in the rotation. <laughs> um, with Bubich, Singer, and Coar, at least for the in the short term, right? For right now, yeah, yeah, and then of course Lynch is at AAA, um, and four of them have made starts this year in the rotation, um, and I mean, and we've seen you know Bubich, you know, for a guy who's who was there all last year, he had to take that step back, and now we've seen him take a step forward this year after pitching out of the bullpen, but um, it's not you know. Like Sam was sort of like what Sam was talking about. It's not a linear thing where it's like, okay, he was on this track and, you know, he was looking really good in AAA. And so then he's going to move up to the majors and he's going to keep on making it. It doesn't go straight line like that. It would be, you know, things would be a whole lot easier and a lot different if he was just like, okay, guy looked good in AAA and you get him to the majors and this is how he's going to look. But it's not, it doesn't work that way. Not for many guys at all. Can we draw a parallel, Sam, to, um, you know, where the 2018 pitchers are now to maybe 2011 when, you know, Eric Hosmer, Mike Moustakis uh, made their debuts, Lorenzo Cain, Alcides Escobar just come over. They were young and, and you know, not major league ready at seemingly at the time. Um, and of course, great things happened to, you know, with, with those players on those teams is, um, it's like we're talking pitching versus you know batting order here, but can can you uh, can you feel optimistic in that way? I think that's the hope. You know, I, I think that's what the Royals are hoping for. I think in that 2011 um, season, and and Vahe, you you might want to double check me on this, but I think this is right. Uh, th they were they were over 500, I believe. They they were like a game or two over 500 from a certain date when those guys started coming up. I think maybe the Salvi date in Tampa going forward, they, they were above 500. And, and those guys, for the most part, I mean, everybody's going to have their, their ups and their downs, but um, those guys, at least in my memory, performed pretty well right off the bat, especially Salvi. Um, yeah. And he was hitting over 300. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was before Major League Baseball realized he'd swing at anything. Um, but, you know, these guys, um, I think, are similarly talented, you know, and, and it's a little awkward comparing pitchers to – to position players, but, um, you know, this class, and, and I think it'll include Bobby Witt Jr. Um, pretty soon, you know, him and these pitchers that we're talking about, they're, they're as talented 
as, you know, collectively as Moustakis, Perez, Hosmer, those guys. Um, I just, it, 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 it takes time. And, you know, I think we need to probably like statistically, I think if you looked at history, history would tell you that one of those four guys is going to bomb, you know, um, and or get hurt. And, and just not have an effective big league career and um, and maybe more. And if you can get one to be really good um, and one or two others to be a good contributor, that's still a really good draft class. And, um, you know, and, and it's a weird deal because I don't know how deep in the weeds we want to get in this, but, um, you know, Singer needs to develop a third pitch, um, you know, and, and Daniel Lynch, um, I keep seeing Andrew Miller and Daniel Lynch, but, you know, if, if he's, an eighth or ninth inning wipeout guy, like that's, that's pretty good. And if Jackson Coar, he's got all the pieces, you know I mean? He's got multiple pitches um, and he's got, despite what we saw last night, he's got some guts. He's got some, some, um, some confidence. And and I think that he is going to get his feet under him and perform. And if, if those kinds of things can happen, then that's going to be, you know, a cornerstone um, for this thing to, to turn around just like that 2011, that wasn't a draft class. But right. that was kind of a, a class that that came up together uh, in a lot of ways. And then was Hosmer the next May? Was he was he May of two thousand twelve? He was eleven. Definitely May. He was it, oh, so he was he was the first one up. And then yeah, Salvi yeah. was kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. You're right. Um, and then Salvi was kind of like the planting the flag down <laughs> and 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 moving forward. So um, I, I do think that look, put it like this: if that two thousand eighteen draft class isn't effective and productive, then the Royals have a lot of Really major problems. That's what that's what I was going to ask you, Vahe. Um, if it's um, if it doesn't work out with this with this 2018, you know, top of the or top of the order draft class, um, I, I don't. <laughs> the, the Royals don't have a you know, a future, do they? Well, they've certainly uh, planted the flag on this. Uh, to borrow Sam's term, I mean, I, I think that this was the declaration of whatever else has been going on that this, this is the hope for the future, right? The core hope for the future. I mean, there's certainly other things. And as, as Dayton has said, y- you know, one thing they, they find urgent is, is uh, that trying to scrunch together the time that Salvi Mondesi and Bobby Witt Jr. will have on the field, for instance, that's, that's a core thought of theirs. And that requires a few moving parts <laughs> to fall into place. But, you know, the other thing with this rotation, it's, it's, uh, with this foursome anyway is it, you guys have all said this in some form or another, but each guy is going to be on his own pace and, you know, we'll learn some stuff from the history of it, but in a way singer is the most um, exemplary aspect of this, right? Just because we've seen him over a little bit of a haul now, and we've certainly seen some progress, but we've certainly seen that uh, he's still a little volatile in some ways. And, I think maybe he's he's a good he's a good thing to focus on just in terms of understanding that whatever pace these guys are on, there's going to be bumps. We're, we've obviously seen it with a couple of them already, and uh, I don't think you can think they're going to be the fully formed deal this year. Um, I think an interesting question is if you're looking towards 2022 and 2023 as being what you hope are more uh, abundantly promising years, how much does them being here now, if all of them are here now, help towards that, or 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 is it is it is it possibly counterproductive if they're struggling here? So there's, you know, there's a lot of questions like that that uh, a lot of people get paid big money to to handle. Yeah, look, I think you take your lumps with these guys now, and um, and, and the fact that they're you know playing 500, right, 29 and 29 with. Um, you know, without Mondesi, who we'll talk about after a break, and uh, with you know Jorge Soler and Hunter Dozier struggling. Although it was great to see Hunter Dozier pick up three hits last night, including his first opposite field uh, hit of the year. Uh, maybe that'll get kickstart him. But the fact that they're the, they have the record that they do uh, with, with with who they've put out there, and they seem to have been less than a hundred percent all season. I think that's progress. So, hey, Larry Looper says, Coar will be fine. Remember your first day at work. I got lost <laughs> on my going to work on my first day. And, and I've and, blacked uh, that out. I, yeah. I'm not. 
<laughs> right. I dominated my first day. All we did was go out to lunch, and then Fitz was like, "Okay, that's it." <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the training. The training went pretty well. I'm trying to remember what I, I filled out a lot of paperwork. That's what I remember. I filled out a lot of paperwork. Um, but I would, uh, Blair. You know what? I, I, let me just throw in there that because we're talking about that pitching class. There was a whole lot of people when we went into spring training talking about how they should just go all in on the young pitchers, and they don't want to see them trotting out. Mike Miner and Jacob Junis and whoever else. And it's like, this is why you need guys. Okay. If you, if you go back and look at, and I'm, and, the, and I still, you know, this is not a, anything against, you know, Lynch or Coar, cause I think they, you know, these guys are obviously really talented guys and have a chance to be really good. But if you went into the season, just rolling, you know, four guys out there who had the total of, I think it was like 20 starts in the big leagues in empty stadiums and said, this is what we're going to go with all year. People would be losing their minds right now, but they all, oh, you know, all this, Oh, we don't want veteran guys. We don't want this. Okay. There's enough of that. Okay. Like ne next time somebody says that to me on social media about how we just need to roll in whoever it is, whether it's Bobby Wood Jr. or something like that. Let me just direct you to last night's game. <laughs> can, can I say something real quick? I'm not trying to hijack the show. But I just want to say that I adore, I, I am emphatically in favor of Lynn's evolution into just continually mocking Twitter on this show every week. It's 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 the best. It's the absolute best. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> well, I, I'd, I'd say in support of Lynn's uh, idea here that uh, if you like the 16 and 9 start and you like the way they uh, they responded to the 11-game losing streak, then you can appreciate the veteran pitchers um, that they had because that they helped uh, build that early you know record and help them get out of the you know Keller and and uh, and Miner. Uh, Keller's not a good example, but but Miner certainly. Uh, Danny Duffy. And Danny Duffy, absolutely. Um, quick thought, Lynn. When 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 do we expect him back? Um, it sounded like the, la the last update we got was when he they were in Kansas City. He was throwing. Um, it sounded like he was starting to ramp up a little bit. Um, it's still not certain uh, how soon it would it's going to be. I mean, especially when you figure they you know they brought up Coar and they're definitely looking at him staying in the rotation. So it's not. It doesn't seem like it's imminent. Um, they, Matheny had said let, or pretty early on last week that he was not going to be in the conversation for um, that start that ended up being Coar, so which meant that they knew he wasn't right on the verge. Um, and where now it's a couple of weeks out, um, and a few starts. I'm not sure what that means as far as a rehab assignment. Um, if they're going to want to get him, you know, um, at the last point that we got an update, he hadn't thrown off the mound yet. So I think it's still a little, little ways away. But um, they were encouraged. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a couple of weeks now, but, um, they, there was nothing that indicated that there was any sort of a setback or anything like that. Okay. We'll head to a break on this from, uh, from Mike Garcia. There's a lot to be optimistic about with the pitchers chosen by the Royals in the 2018 draft. Bubich made promising strides in 2021. Singer keeps showing the stuff and poise, perhaps consistency is a factor. And, um, uh, Mike, I, I, I agree with you. I, I do. And uh, um, I, I agree that this is a solid core uh, for years to come. At least I hope you're right. So let's hear from the University of Kansas medical system. The Kansas City Royals lineup is backed up by the region's strongest team in healthcare, The University of Kansas Health System. We both suit up with one goal in mind, to win. The University of Kansas Health System, official health care provider of the Royals. Okay, Lynn, back to you on this. Um, Alberto Mondesi, uh, I want you to take us through the, the process of from the from the injury Monday night, um, the the Monday night ESPN game where he's he's the star of the show, right? The long home run and on the uh, on the eighth inning, you know, ground out where he makes a terrific play, tweaks the hamstring, gets pinch hit for the bottom of the eighth to to lead off the the eighth inning, and we haven't seen him since. So, um, you know, the, the the crazy thing to me was all the reports, you know, over the next you know, 24 to 48 hours were positive. 
and he did, was not put on the injured list, but now he is, and it's backdated. And just uh, let's let's go through what the Royals are saying about Adalberto Mondesi. Yeah, I think there was a lot of hope and optimism, and I mean, and I, I don't. And I'm reading into it, and I'm I'm just wondering whether or not they just didn't want to jump immediately to an injured list stint right after you know he had just gotten off of one, and he and with his history, and I know for him he obviously it's getting to the point where he wants to try and stay off the IL, but um, hamstrings are also tricky. I mean, I, in any sport, like I don't I don't know a hamstring that gets better within a couple of days. Like it's always, especially for a guy like him who's a speed guy. But what it went from, you know, okay, he felt better the next morning. Um, I think there was some hope that, okay, if you give it a little bit of time, they're going to test it out a little bit day by day and see where he was at. Um, and there was talk of, okay, maybe one of these days he'll be able to be used off of the bench, which is sort of what you saw with Jorge Soler, who, came, who had that groin injury. Um, they knew he wasn't going to be able to play right away. You saw Olivares come up. And then, but then there was a few days where it was like, okay, he's available off of the bench. And then a day or so after that, it was like, okay, he's full go and he's back in the lineup. So I think they were sort of hoping for something like that, but it just never got there. I mean, they, he did early work each day and um, it just didn't sound like he was able to go full speed. And at that point, it's like, well, you just, you can't avoid the IL stint. If he's going to need that much time, he's not going to be able to go full out and, you're still going to be worried about him re-injuring it or making it worse. And you're sort of playing, you know, somewhat shorthanded um, by still having him active and not using that roster spot. Then it just, it didn't make sense after a while. Okay. Well, we know the, you know, we, we know what fans are saying, right. That um, he's a player that can't be, you know, we can't, can't be counted upon or, you know, for his presence as, you know, these are the injuries, the oblique to open the season, and now a hamstring or the soft tissue injuries that, look, they're nagging for sure, and, um, and, and uh, you, you just you – know, you do have to wait them out. But seven games, in, you know, it, we've seen Mondesi play. They, he was terrific in, in those seven games. He was fantastic. But are we getting – are we approaching a point, Vahe, with, with Mondesi that – um, that you can begin to question his, I don't know, does he, does he have the, can, can he, you know, can he differentiate between, you know, playing hurt and, and playing injured and uh, what, um, you know, what are we to make of, of Mondesi and his unavailability? It's the, sort of the question for our times uh, because if you look at it, I mean, he's still 25, right? I think he turns 26 on uh, July 27th or something like that. And so it's on one hand, you think he's been around a little while. On the other hand, you realize he's still pretty young. We've seen the upside. We've seen the ceiling. And it, let's let's leave Bobby Witt Jr. out of the discussion for now just because we're not, we're not seeing him yet up here. And it'll probably at least be some weeks, I guess. But among the guys that are on this team, I think we can safely say he's got the highest upside. So um, the same, I said this to Lynn the other day, we were just chatting. I think you think the same genes that make him seem a bit injury prone are the genes that make him uh, quite exceptional as, as, a, as a package. And so the question is, okay, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? And I, I think to me, the upside is, is still my guiding light here. And uh, it's entirely possible this is gonna plague him all his career. Um, but to me, it's also entirely possible that some of these things have just been a run of bad luck. The types of injuries that, that are nagging and maybe, maybe he's not going to have this afflicting him all through his career. It, it, that sounds a little, as I say, those words coming out of my mouth, it sounds a little Pollyanna like and a little too optimistic, but I just think that you got to keep, keep, your hopes on this guy. I think he's too important. And I know there's people that want to see him go. Um, I mean, to, to Lynn's, Lynn's gang on Twitter, um, that, that that's, I'm sure that's the case in some places, but to me, it strikes me as a classic case. If this guy ever ends up on another team in the near future, it, it, it's going to be uh, ru ruinous to, to 
um, Royals fans because you're going to see the upside. It'll just happen that way. Oh, he'll he'll destroy the Royals. <laughs> no doubt about that. That uh, you know he you know what he he would uh, probably end up in the division and get to kill the Royals eighteen or nineteen <laughs> times a year. So um, uh, so. All right, Sam. Let's uh, let, let's have it. Yeah, knowing, let's hear it, Sam. Yeah, knowing full well that the Royals have a shortstop in Omaha right now, playing very well. <laughs> yeah, and, and with a history of durability as well. <laughs> who doesn't? Guy. Yeah, who doesn't miss games? Yeah, yeah. As, as my friend Stephen St. John said the other day, um, Alcides Escobar will never get hurt, even if you want him to. <laughs> he will. He will be in the line <laughs> no matter what. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, if I can join Lynn's dunk show just for a quick second, um, wanting Mondesi gone is lunacy, just absolute insanity. Um, but I do think we're at this point where you can't count on the guy. Um, you, you just can't. And shortstop is is the worst position to have this on because pitchers, you have enough pitchers and there's moving parts. Um, there's not a lot of teams that have two guys that can play above average defensive big league shortstop. Um, the Royals certainly don't. You know, there, there is a huge drop between Alcides Escobar as a shortstop and Nicky Lopez um, as a shortstop. But they are in this weird spot, I think, now where I don't think they can depend on Mondesi to be healthy. Um, and maybe that means spending a little bit more of, of your limited payroll on somebody that can play shortstop. Maybe he's also a second baseman. Maybe he's Bobby Witt Jr. I don't know. But you you, you kind of need somebody else that can play that position because it, it's it's frustrating as hell, um, and it's, it's frustrating. I don't want to get th – this is not like a Mondesi is soft kind of thing, but there has been – I mean, even when he was in the minor leagues – you heard people saying, um, you know, he's just got to figure out the difference between injured and something that he can play through. And I think there was some hope or expectation that that would come as he got a little bit older. And um, and, and and also, you know, not insignificantly, um, he's arbitration eligible. Um, you know, I think there was some hope that once you start playing for money like that, um, things change. I mean, that's, that's, that's the way this business works. So, um, that hasn't happened. Um, again, I'm not saying that he should play through this hamstring injury, but I am saying that they delayed put him on the DL or the IL, um, for a few days, which is a sign that the team thought it was something that he might be able to play through. So th there's, there's just, there's a lot of moving parts here. Mondesi, I know is frustrated as hell about this as well. Um, but I just don't think that going forward, the Royals can let themselves be in a position where, they don't have another guy that can play that position. Look, you can't <clears> – <throat> Nicky Lopez is not the shortstop of the future for the, for this team. He just, he just isn't. Um, he's, a, he's the stopgap. And, look, this was a guy that wasn't going to be with the team coming out of spring training and is with the team because of the Mondesi, the original Mondesi injury. So it's just um, – I, I don't know. You just – Again, I'll go back to something we talked about earlier. The, the, the Royals have played all but seven games this year without their, you know, not their best. Yeah, you can call them their best player, but certainly the player with the greatest potential. And they're still a 500 ball club, you know, without him, which I I think speaks well for what this uh, this team has put together uh, so far this season. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. I, I so they backdated right, Lynn. They backdated it to was it June. Fourth, I believe, and uh, yes, something like that. So he'll June fourth, yeah, yeah. Fourteenth is when he could come off the Royals. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I think they'll they'll, they'll have finished this West Coast road trip, I believe, by then, and they'll be home um, next week. So maybe we'll see Mondesi back then. Um, yeah, it's just uh, just frustrating to to. Uh, it reminds me a little bit. Sam and, and Vahe of and, and Lynn, you were covering, I believe, covering the team that year, the Eric Berry year, right? Of uh, you know, he was just, Ooh, Blair, <laughs> yeah, went there. Right there. <laughs> no, but I, I, I actually do think that that is instructive because I, I think that that's an example of, and again, I'm not saying anybody's soft, but for an athlete to perform, there's got to be two yeses. The 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 medical staff has to say yes, and the player has to say yes. And if the medical staff says yes, that doesn't mean that the player has to say yes or that the player is soft 
if he doesn't. The player has to know his body better than anybody else. But it's I, I actually think that that's a very instructive <laughs> um, local analogy. And people aren't going to like it, but I, I think that that's a real thing. I've been trying to avoid using the term literally day to day. <laughs> well, we heard that term every day, day to day. Yes. And we, we also heard it did. I mean, those couple of days, it was only, you know, like uh, he, he missed uh, four games. Um, there was an off day mis mixed in, in, in there too. But uh, to hear progress every day was <laughs> that did harken back to the Andy Reid. He's making progress because he was making progress for, was it four months? I think Eric Berry was. Yeah. yeah. And, and when, who was it? Was it Andy or Rick that said literally day to day? Uh, but w when they said that, I felt like they were in on the joke. You know, they were like, all right, guys, I know, I know, I know. But literally <laughs> day to day. <laughs> you know, big difference in those scenarios. Eric Berry was you know, at the end of his career, right? There would only be one more season. And um, and, um, and modesty is at the, you know, close close to the beginning of, of his career. Um Hopefully he comes back soon and he will pick up where he left off just as he did when he, when he, you know, look, he had the hottest, what was it? Three weeks at the end of last season was incredible and just picked up where he left off this year. So, um, okay guys, it was a, oh, look, hang on. Mike, Bar Mike Garcia says Lorenzo Cain got hurt a lot as well. Absolutely. Right. You know, Lorenzo Cain was uh, boy. I always used to, when Lorenzo Cain was beating out like an infield hit or something, he would take that long, that long step to first base, that long last step. I just thought, oh, no, here it goes. <laughs> here it goes. Um, but you're right, Mike. Lorenzo Cain got hurt a lot as well. So um, fingers crossed that Montessi will be back soon, and, uh, and he'll pick up where he left off. So uh, we'll do the same thing. We'll pick up where we left off next week, uh, next Tuesday. Please join us. Thanks a lot to, for, for joining us today. And big thanks to Vahe Gregorian, Sam Ballinger, Lynn Worthy, and our producer, Beth Welsh. Thanks to all of you for joining us today and to the University of Kansas Health System. We'll talk to you again in a week.